end in sight with my back pain, nothing cause, because nothing was helping at the time. So I was in pretty bad shape mentally. And also, um, as a former athlete, I had no, when I lost that, my, my identity, my passion was really gone. I had no passion for work. I couldn't find anything to replace the feeling of being involved in sports. And then when I was introduced to Chinese medicine, everything changed. It was like, oh my God, this stuff is amazing. Um, I want to learn more about it. And uh, I became quite passionate about it. About uh, three, three, three to six months later, I decided to change careers and become an acupuncturist. So it was a life-changing experience for me, really, I think, a life-saving experience. Um, so uh, as far as educationally, I, I went to uh, uh, the primary uh, educational system in the United States is TCM. Uh, most schools teach TCM, and TCM is, um, is more of a Zhang Fu uh, oriented system. It's more looking at internal disharmonies. and. Um, <coughs> which was good. It was good for more internal stuff, but with pain, I didn't find it to be as uh, a little bit hard to use, to utilize, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and uh, during the clinic, I was exposed to some different things. I was exposed to a, a man that did a lot of master tongue points, so a lot of distal points, so that was uh, something really new for me. And I saw hundreds of people that he treated, and um, it was interesting, and it did help people. But I, it didn't get the dramatic results that I knew what were possible with acupuncture. So I, always, I was always tied into this more local point orientation that Dr. Chen did. Although he did distal points as well, it seemed like most of the, most of the effects are really from treating more locally. Uh, I went to another acupuncturist that was really interesting, a, a man named Robert Zeiger, um, who did auricular therapy. And uh, he actually he really specialized in it. And he actually looked in my ear and he said to me, he says, when did you have your knee surgery on your left knee? I thought, wow, you know, how did you know that? You know, I went back to him years later. I said, how did you know that I had knee surgery by looking in my ear? He says, well, you know, if you look at the, the point that corresponds to the knee, you've got a little dark vein that runs through that area. So he knew I had some, some trauma there, some blood stagnation. So sometimes surgeries will show up in the ear. Little markings will show up, which was fascinating. He did some other things that blew me away. He was incredible pulse diagnosis. As a diagnostician, he was... He was amazing. And if you ever had any doubts about whether th there's any truth to, to pulse diagnosis, you should go see this guy, Dr. Zeiger, because he would blow your mind. You don't have to tell him what's wrong with you. He will, he'll tell you. I mean, it was that. I remember he was taking p my pulse, my lung pulse. I didn't know it at the time, but he says to me, I'm thinking this to myself. I'm feeling a lot of tension in my chest. So he was actually the very first acupuncturist I went to for, for a very short time because he was far away. And... And I'm thinking to myself, I've got this, I'm feeling tension right now in my chest. No, no sooner did those, did those thoughts go through my mind, he says to me, he says, you're feeling tension, right? Right, kind of in this area, aren't you? I said, well, yeah, how did you know that? So I went back years to, and asked him how he, how, how he knew that. And he says, well, if you take the lung pulse and if you roll it a little bit, you can feel if there's any tension in this area of your body. I thought, wow, this is really advanced stuff. You know, he was, he was an amazing man. He did some auricular acupuncture. So he did some points in my ear too. And uh, at the time, I couldn't, bend, I couldn't bend forward at all. It was completely gone. So he did some points, and he actually treated the back of my ear. So he found where the low back was, in, and then just went to the back of the ear and treated it. And his, his uh, thoughts were that if you treat the back of the ear, it's, it's more for muscular tension. So it's something to play with. And, and in my opinion, most pain is, is due to mus muscular constriction, some contraction. And so by treating the, the back of the ear might have some special benefits. But as soon as he put the, the pin in my ear, he says, bend over again, I bend over. It, just, it was so easy. It was amazing. So it, it taught me the, 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 some of the strengths of auricular uh, acupuncture. It wasn't long-lasting, um, as, uh, as Dr. Chen's treatments were, but it, it gave me some relief. So I use uh, uh, ear acupuncture more for adjunct although some people use it as, as their primary treatment uh, methodology, which is fine too. Um, but I just, I just got so much more benefit from more of a local point orientation, okay? So, um, but anyway, this exposure to, to auricular therapy kind of got me on a whole thing for, for studying microsystems in the body. So I, started, I studied many microsystems. I actually studied reading the hand too. I spent three years actually learning how to read the hands. And it's not predictive, it's more um, issue-oriented type of a, a, a palmistry. And, it, and just like reading the tongue or reading the ear, you can 
they're, they're microsystems. They actually can tell you what's going on inside the body. So the hundreds of years ago, they didn't have ways. They didn't have x-ray machines. They couldn't do blood work. So they figured out body reading systems. So they looked at our external landscape, and they could tell what was going on inside our bodies by what our external landscape was. Well, this is just an extension of it. The lines reveal personality traits and, and inclination to behave a certain way. Uh, the shape of our hand, everything means something. And uh, you can tell a lot about one's personality just by how they hold their hands. And uh, I'll, show, I'll talk to you a little bit about a neat thing I did with a, a four gates with somebody um, that might, might bring that home a little bit. Uh, also with auricular therapy, a uh, couple of things that I had in my private practice, uh, well besides the, uh, Dr. Zeiger's uh, experience with, with telling me what was going on, he did some other, told me some other things about what was going on with my health, the look in my ear also. But years later I had a patient that was, um, had his knee, uh, had amputated from his knee down. And he came to me, he had some pain in kind of the stump right, right above where the knee was. And so I go, how am I, I going to treat this? You know, so I decided to try some uh, ear acupuncture to see if I could uh, get to it. So uh, I hooked a couple points up, you know, lower the knee, lower extremity. I put the, put the pins in the ear and I hooked it up to electricity. And as I started to turn up, he's, this person never had acupuncture before. It was his first time. So he's going, what are you doing? Sticking pin, pins in my ear from my knee, right? So I had to explain to him a little bit about uh, pathways in the body. And, and uh, anyway, as, as I started to turn the amplitude up, he says, oh my God, what are you doing? And I said, well, what do you mean? Wh what's going on? He goes, well, I'm feeling tapping in my toe of the foot that wasn't there. So it just kind of validated this whole connection between our ear and our, our body. It's uh, fascinating stuff. Um, I love microsystems. Uh, I love studying them, um, but I use them more as adjunct therapy than, than the, the main therapy. So, okay. so I pract was in private practice for probably seven years. Uh, I, I was in t 20 I was 20 25 years actually. I was in private practice total. But after the first seven years, I started treating. Uh, a lot of patients, I see a lot of patients with low back pain, and I could not get the results that Dr. Chen got on me, and it was incredibly frustrating. So, but I knew the potential of acupuncture. I knew what, what was possible. So I kept trying, I kept trying different things. Um, but you don't want to take too many chances with, with patients in your own practice. You don't want to lose them. So I was fairly conservative. Cha uh, changes I made were really subtle. But when I got into working, I got hired by Kaiser uh, after about seven years. And it was a chronic pain clinic, and all I saw was pain all day, 20-some patients every day. And I'd see a lot of the same types of pain. And, uh, I don't know about you, but the number one nice I thing I see, and most practitioners see in practice, is low back pain, right? And second most common thing we see usually is upper trapezius pain. Those are the two most common things I, I saw in private practice and then what we see at Kaiser. And those areas of our body are tied into our thought process. They're hardwired to our mind and, and our, our how we think and stress patterns. And for some reason, those muscle groups are tied into um, tied into our thoughts. They're really hardwired to our brain. So that's where we, t we tend to see people uh, that have problems, mostly low back and upper trap area pain. But what I saw, is I began to see after treating hundreds of people, was that I would see pain would occur in very specific sites involving very specific muscles. And I saw it over and over again. I saw when I uh, see low back pain, I'd see pain uh, along the erector muscles. Sometimes it would be a little bit more lateral, but almost always it would be more centralized. Okay, and I'll talk about the, the, the erector muscles and which ones I think was where, where our pain really tends to be, um, come from, emanate from. Um, so I saw this commonality, this, this, uh, it w and it actually became predictable. I could, I could, if somebody told me they had shoulder blade pain, I almost knew exactly which muscle was involved. And I would palpate that area, and I'd find a, mu a muscle that was either banded or was knotted, was flawed in some way. Somehow the architecture was changed. Instead of the muscle fibers lining up and, 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 and very being very smoothly gliding, there was something different about the architecture. Okay, and I'm going to show you exactly how to find these sites. Okay, when we do a little bit of demo, so you'll know exactly what to look for. Um, <coughs> yeah, or they told me they had upper shoulder pain, upper trapezius area pain. Nine times out of ten, it was uh, levator scapula pain. And it's just learning how to find that muscle uh, and then needling it correctly. Okay. 
Okay. So, so what is, where is pain coming from? And it de so it depends who you talk to. If you talk to a chiropractor, they're going to talk about subluxation theory, uh, alignment of the spine. Uh, if you go to an MD, they're going to look at x-rays. They're going to say you've got degenerative discs, bulging discs, stenosis, arthritis, whatever. That's where they're going to point you down that road. Um, which is interesting because if you looked at my x-rays, uh, my, my x-rays looked like a, an old man. Um, I've got incredibly uh, degenerative disc disease, f actually fairly severe. And I've got bulging discs, but I have no pain anymore. So imaging can be really misleading. You, I've seen people with incredibly terrible x-rays. Um, that have no pain at all. Uh, so you just don't know about that. You just, uh, I don't put a lot of stock so much in x-rays as I used to. And there's actually been studies about that, and I'll talk to you about it all. Kaiser's done some studies on that that, are, that have kind of cast doubt on the efficacy of, of uh, using imaging for pain. So I developed, started developing more of a myofascial orientation because that's actually how I, how I recovered. One of the few things that really helped me is um, compression type massage and one chiropractor actually showed me this type of work. He didn't do so much adjusting, adjusting as he did more, he had a little tool, he, he'd do compression on the muscles, on the uh, erector muscles, paraspinal muscles, and that actually gave me some relief for a while. And so I found some tools that I could do at home, use on home. I used something called a knobble I used for, for many years. Now I use uh, another tool I'll show you later because whenever you have a problem, especially back pain, you need to go through a rehabilitation stage. You need to strengthen those muscles too, or you need to get those muscles to relax. So there's a couple tools that I use, and I'll show you later um, how to use these tools to apply pressure, compression along the muscles, and get those muscles to relax. Because usually you'll find these muscles are hypertonic, especially in people with pain. They're almost always very tense. So treatment should be geared towards relaxing, relaxing those tense muscles. Okay, and that's what acupuncture does better than any other thing. You can do massage forever. You can do compression massage, shiatsu massage, deep tissue massage. But when you get into the belly of the muscle with a needle, it's a whole different ball game. Okay, because you're you're much deeper, and especially when you use the electricity, it's going to vibrate the needle, and that vibration it's going to do a couple things. But one of the things it's going to do it's going to relax the muscle, it's unfold the muscle. So when I use electroacupuncture, I always use it on muscle. Right. Some people don't. Some people use it more just for joint stuff. One of my heroes, my, uh, I think is a great acupuncturist, uh, David Legg, who, who just did a seminar, clo he wrote Close to the Bone. He uses it more for joint issues, which is great, but he doesn't use it for muscle stuff. Um, but I think that's where most of our pain is coming from, soft tissue muscles. Okay, so to not use it for muscle stuff. Uh, we're not using it optimally. We can use it, we can use Hawato points, we can use joint or into the joint uh, needling, but we need to treat the muscle too, surrounding muscle. Okay. One of the people that had a, a lot of influence on me early in my career was uh, uh, an acupuncturist named Mark Seam uh, from back east. He, he opened my eyes to other types of uh, forms of acupuncture. I was totally indoctrinated in the TCM model, which is the only model I knew. And, but Mark Seem showed me there's a whole different model, different, different approaches to treating, uh, especially musculoskeletal pain. And he saw all pain as more um, superficial constrictions, muscle constrictions of the body. And that to find those, you have to palpate the body. And that palpation has become a lost art, especially in TCM. We don't palpate the body as much. As much. Japanese style, there's a lot of palpation involved. So sometimes if you want to blend things, you want to use, borrow from other, the way other people utilize uh, acupuncture. Just don't be stuck in one model. Uh, when I started, this really opened my eyes for treating different ways um, and looking more. Again, it kind of, it, it kind of went right with the direction I was kind of leading more towards m muscular issues, muscular tension as causing people's pain. Because even though I had incredible, ex terrible looking x-rays, I still got better with, comp even with just compression massage that made, it made it feel better. So something about what they did to the muscles, I hope I didn't unplug myself, something about what he did to the muscles um, made a huge difference, even, even, even just by compression. So different styles of massage, some styles I think work better than others. I prefer compression techniques more com uh, holding pressure, sustained pressure on a muscle. You can glide over a muscle forever, but it'll never kind of release those, what we'll call, talk about trigger points in a minute. 
it, but if you actually apply sustained pressure, you'll get much better relief. So if you like doing any, uh, many people don't like doing body work. Uh, uh, I, I like doing a little bit of it. I used to, as I was, when I was younger in my practice, I did tons of it because I couldn't get results with acupuncture as much as I wanted. So I was doing, a I was making up with a lot of body work and I was wearing myself out. But as I started getting better and getting more improved results, I started steering away from some of the body work. But I still use it for certain conditions. And I'll show you which ones that I think are really necessary to, um, to cure. You need to, do, you need to do some manual therapy sometimes. Okay. Okay, so we're looking at way level. We're looking at the very superficial level. We're not looking at uh, a Zong Fu orientation for causing the pain. We're looking at the musculoskeletal system. So does imaging reveal uh, ideology? Uh, Kaiser did some interesting research. Actually, I went to a lecture, a regional uh, lecture for acupuncturist at Kaiser, and a surgeon did the, uh, did the presentation. And he talked about w the research they found that all of, all of the x-rays they did, all of the imaging they did, in a huge percentage of the cases, those were not pain generators. They'd see stenosis, bulging disc, arthritis, you name it. But they found that those actually weren't causing people's pain. In a large for a large percentage of people. So <coughs> there has been kind of a shift more towards uh, muscular ide ideology. Uh, that's the soft tissue, something in the soft tissue that's causing the pain, which, is, which was perfect when I heard that. I was like, oh my God, this is uh, the direction I've been going for quite a while. So it kind of validated everything. At least I feel like I was, okay, I'm on the right, I'm on the right course here. Um, so these, this, these structural issues that show up in x-rays are in many cases and many times just incidental. They're there, they're underlying everything, but they're not actually pain generators. They're not actually causing a person's pain. And I found this to be true so much because I see people, I see it every day. And everybody that comes to me has some structural issue that shows up on their x-ray. Everyone, they've got bulging discs, arthritis, you name it, they've got everything. And they still get better. So don't get freaked out and try to allay people's fears. Uh, in fact, when I went to this, uh, the one acupuncturist, Robert Zeiger, that did the ear, the ear stuff on me, he, well, first thing he told me was, I, I was telling him about my x-rays, and he goes, first thing he told me, he says, don't worry about that. That's not where your pain is coming from. It's muscle. And, but I wasn't ready for that yet. I, I was totally still indoctrinated in the Western medicine, and, and, and you know, their x-rays show this. That must be what's causing my pain. So I wasn't ready to hear that yet. So even after he treated me, I felt a little bit better. I still went the, the, the Western uh, allopathic medicine uh, way. So it took me a while to really kind of open my mind. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is uh, a little kind of interesting information here. We'll just go through a couple of them. So in people in their 20s, 75% uh, and these are people with no symptoms. 75% have disc bulges uh, in their 20s, and then uh, above that, 60 is it 80, 87% show disc bulges, but have no pain, asymptomatic. Right? Uh, people in their 30s, it looks like this, or 50s, it looks like it's 80% to have disc degeneration, 36% disc protrusion, but asymptomatic. Meniscal abnormality, same thing. It's people are showing all of these structural issues on x-rays, but yet they have no pain. Kaiser had, had really the same experience wh with, what they, with, with what they found. People were showing all of these structural problems, but yet in many cases were not having the, the pain associated with that particular area. I've seen people with carpal tunnel in uh, a positive carpal tunnel test but it's, they're not having on one side, but they're not even having problems on that side. They're having problems on the other side. I actually got tested. Uh, we had a health fair for our acupuncturist at, for practitioners at Kaiser, and I saw this, somebody was doing uh, nerve conduction tests on people, checking for carpal tunnel. And I said, oh, let me, you know, here, I don't have any symptoms, but let me try. I tested positive for severe carpal tunnel. I thought, wow, I don't have any symptoms. He goes, well, you're, you're testing positive severely. I said, wow, okay. So I started working on myself more lately, but I, you know, I, I'm still, there's no symptoms. So, so you can kind of allay people's fears sometimes that come in with, with x-rays that show these terrible things. 
And because it's not, in many cases, it's not actually the cause of people's problem. It's not the cause of their pain. Very interesting. <coughs> so m I've had a few epiphanies, but my first epiphany was, was this, was about realizing that, that pain was, in most cases, was coming from soft tissue, not, not a deeper structural issue. <coughs> Mark Seem calls our soft tissue the fabric of life. And it's our soft tissue that really reacts to stress, life stressors. It's not the bones. Okay. It's our soft tissue, it's our muscles. And they tend to constrict. And, it can, it's, and it's an insidious process usually, it happens over years. And sometimes people have an event that sets it off. But it wasn't just that event, it was actually usually building for years before that. Okay. So my whole target, what I'm really trying to do, my goal in treating people is to restore proper architecture of the muscles. Find out where the flaw is in the muscle and get that muscle to reshape and relax. And sometimes you gotta do a little bit of manual therapy to help, to help smooth the muscle out. Not too much, just a little bit. But acupuncture is the most powerful thing for actually getting constrictions out of muscle, so it's the best starting point for sure. Mark Seems, Mark Seems says that, that we have to restore informed touch into our therapy. And I totally, totally agree. I think touching patients, uh, palpating patients, is, is not only a diagnostic, it's, it's used for two things, diagnostics and it's used for treatment, okay. So you need to palpate to find where the problem is. Sometimes you have to palpate to actually help correct the problem. So sometimes you need to use it for both, okay? But we need to restore the art of palpation, I think, in treating, especially for, mus for musculoskeletal pain. Not for internal stuff, but for, for musculoskeletal pain, for sure. So if you look at most classes you can take, like the seminars you can take for uh, today, most are really targeted towards distal therapies, right? Master tongue, uh, balance method, uh, many microsystems, ear acupuncture, Korean hand therapy. There's tons of them, right? And, but they're all geared towards distal. Everyone's starting to give up on this local point orientation. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's become almost uh, uh, a dying art, uh, uh, local therapy. But for chronic pain, someone's been in long-standing pain, you have to go local. You have all this tension that's in one spot in a muscle and usually there's a lot of guarding that takes place around that tension and it's very difficult to get there. I'm not saying you can't help because you can. You can help reduce it but you need to change that structure and the only way that to really change it is to get a needle into the deep into the muscle of it. That'll speed up your results more than anything else. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so she asked about cupping. What do I, uh, if I, I don't do a lot of cupping, although we're starting to use it a little bit more in, at Kaiser because people seem to, to respond really positively to it. You know, cupping is now called de decompression. Have you heard that? Yeah. Yeah, so, so physical therapy is poaching our medicine, basically, right? They've, they've created, well, f uh, first dry, ni dry needling, right? We don't have to worry about that, that in California, but it's a huge problem in other states. It's really uh, unfortunate. Um, so they call acupuncture now dry needling. Uh, they're just look, looking for trigger points. They're looking for the twitch. Uh, uh, and then they started cupping on somebody, one of the, my colleagues, I work with physical therapy and, and occupation. I work in an occupational medicine clinic also. So I see, c I see acute pain also, as well as chronic pain. It's really, because uh, they're a little bit different. Um, <coughs> and uh, this guy told me, hey, I took a class this weekend in a, a decompression class. I said, well, what's decompression? So he pulls out these cups. <laughs> I said, I said, that's cupping. I said, we've been doing this for hundreds of years. He goes, yeah. He had a big book, you know, was taught by a physical therapist, and, and, and they were cupping over the spine. They were doing all sorts of stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's so, I mean, uh, imitation's the greatest form of therapy. Uh, uh, what's that, how's that go? Uh, we should be, like, maybe we should be honored that they're, 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 they, they feel that our therapies are, are strong enough that they're copying them. Uh, we can feel threatened also. Uh, certainly if dry needling was, was legal in, in California, I'd probably be a little more threatened about it. Uh, disappointed with that. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to deal with that in California. Um, 
the cupping is actually, we've gotten great feedback from patients at from, uh, using cupping, at Ki especially at Kaiser now. I did, never did a lot at my private practice because I just got to where I was so focused on getting better at acupuncture and I wanted to get better at, at getting results with that and especially electroacupuncture. I just kept pounding away at that uh, until, I, until I got to where I felt like I, I, I didn't need to do anything else, you know. Um, one thing about cupping, you know, what we learned is make sure you tell the patients before the treatment what's gonna possibly going to happen. You're going to get these big marks, bruises, right? Uh, we had a chiropractor that worked at Kaiser, and he did uh, another poached one of our treatments. Uh, he did something called Graston technique. So we had my, and my uh, when I had private practice, I had this guy that I shared space with a chiropractor. And he goes, hey, I learned this great therapy this weekend. And he had all these, brought out these nice shiny silver tools. And he goes, and he showed me how to do it. And he scraped my mind. I goes, go sha. He goes, I spent, he said, I spent $1,200 on tools. I said, $1, I have I a have $5 tool, a little <laughs> buffalo horn. I said, I, I said, wow. And, um, but that chiropractor was trying to do it at, started to do it at Kaiser. <coughs> and he did some, he did some grasping, did, uh, up someone's upper shoulder and they, br and it looked purple. And the person freaked out and told that the MD's there and he was gone that fast. <coughs> so you want to make sure you prepare patients for what, what can happen, with cut, whether it's cupping or, or uh, we actually have people fill a f out a form now at Kaiser, just saying, tells them what the possibilities are that it could show this, this discoloration and yeah. Um, yeah, <coughs> they're pretty funny. Yeah, so, <coughs> so Graston technique has uh, been poached that, they, they, they coached uh, cupping, they, they poached that and dry needling, I'm not sure what's next. Uh, they can't hook up electricity to the, the dry needling, so, so maybe we're safe there, at least for now. Um, Are you saying dry needling is illegal in California? Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Uh, uh, if they're acupuncturists, it's okay. But if it's... Chiropractors and uh, physical therapists... Wow, wow. Really? Yeah. They're not legal in California, as far as I know, so unless anybody has... <coughs> I'm pretty sure it's not. Yeah. A lot of people <laughs> practice outside the rules. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. Whitfield Reeves, did anybody know Whitfield Reeves? The name Whitfield Reeves is really famous in orthopedic acupuncture. Yeah. So <coughs> he, he, he uses the term, he is focusing on anatomically significant points. And so we're finding where the muscle or the tendon, where the inflammation is, and we're needling that area. So, yeah, a little different approach. Again, TCM education focused, a big, huge focus on uh, herbal medicine, right? <coughs> um, and Zong Fu orientation for pain. So I just found it so difficult to get, make sense of that for treating pain. Um, it's, let me just show you, maybe the next slide. These are the, well, I'll show you, to you later. Dave Legg has a, a real simple illustration uh, I thought was, was interesting. Anybody familiar with Dave Legg and close to the bone stuff? He's um, he's he's just a great a great acupuncturist and I and a really a humble guy, uh, open to new things. He I, I love the guy, and uh, he has a little a little drawing that he makes up about how he treats, and so this is the main main meridian. Sorry about my writing. Um, and the Zong Fu is deep, uh, deep in the body here, right? And it's connected by, by, by a meridians directly. But the musculoskeletal system is up here. In the way level. Maybe connected by some, some collaterals but not directly related to Zong Fu. So this is a system into itself, okay? Most pain is really coming from musculoskeletal. It's musculoskeletal pain. Very seldom have I seen somebody, honestly, with organ-related pain. Unless somebody has I don't, um, gallstones or something, something significant like that, then I could see uh, the connection. But for most, for most, painful conditions, you need, if you, you get, 
I think if you look at the musculoskeletal system, that's that's where the rubber hits the road. That's what that's what we're, that's what we're going to do. That's the approach we're taking today, anyway. Okay, and you can try it. And with anything, any type of new system you learn, you have to take a little bit of a leap of faith to start, you know, and and, and just try it and see how how it resonates with you. This is this therapy is not for everybody. You know, everybody. A lot of people just prefer distal points. Totally accept that. It's a great system unto itself. But I'm going to show you more of a local, <coughs> local point orientation that I think gets the most dramatic results quickly. A life change, sometimes life changing results. I see people that have been in pain for 20 years sometimes, and like that, they see change. And so if you can change a person's psyche that quick, you just gain their confidence so fast. Um, I think it's worth trying. And you can still do distal stuff with it. And I believe really the best of both worlds is to do local points and combine them with distal points. <coughs> Dr. Chen did that with me. He did local points uh, for my low back. But he, he always would do UB40, uh, sometimes UB60. But he used three inch needles on UB40. <coughs> and I would jump. He had a very traditional style. It was a very uh, grabbing the cheek type, type of style. It wasn't for everybody. <coughs> but when you're desperate enough, you're in as much pain, you'll do anything. And the results were worth the payoff for me. Okay. It was later, much later, when he actually introduced electroacupuncture for me. It was actually for a dis different area of the body. I don't know why he didn't use it for my lower back. He could have very easily uh, and not cause me so much pain, <laughs> pain initially because the treatments are very powerful. I mean, every point you jump. It was a very thrusting style of acupuncture. <coughs> he didn't use guide tubes. His hands were just all over the needle. So maybe not great clean needle technique. And a lot of times I don't use a great clean needle technique either. I like to, because I use a, ver a fairly thin needle. So I'd like to guide it with my other hand too. I apologize for that, but I've done it for 25 years. It's hard to break a habit. Um, but uh, <coughs> yeah, you can, you can simulate uh, electro, what you get, the results you get with electroacupuncture if you use a, a, a traditional acupuncture, a very strong uh, needling dot chi grabbing uh, technique. But boy, I tell you, I just didn't feel comfortable with that, doing that on people. In this country, not many people do. They, they're afraid if you're going to cause them initial pain, they're not going to come back, right? That's, that's what the greatest fear is. But I just couldn't, mentally, I couldn't, couldn't do that to people and have them, j I just didn't feel comfortable. So I knew I had to develop a different style. I had to develop the use of electroacupuncture to get that. Because the great thing about electroacupuncture, if it's used correctly, you can treat very gently and you let the machine do the work. It's a big fallacy that you have to, that electrotherapy is a, is a strong, uncomfortable therapy. It's actually very gentle if it's used correctly. And that's one of the advantages. And you don't even have to be quite as specific. You don't have to be exactly on the point. It gives you a little bit more room for error. Um, yeah. Um, if you grab the chi too, that's bonus points. I mean, you're going to get a little bit better results if you grab the chi always. But you don't, it's not necessary with electrotherapy. You'll see. Does it matter the type of machine you use? So machines, I'm going to, a little bit later, I'm going to compare machines and, and tell you the strengths and weaknesses of each. Yeah, so it really does. I totally recommend investing in a decent machine, a good machine. And I'll, I'll tell you exactly what machines that I use and I think that are the best and uh, machines that I think may not be um, so beneficial. They don't have the right frequency or their, their pulse width is not correctly. There's a, there's some different factors, yeah. So we'll, we'll definitely talk about that. It's really important. I'm even going to teach you how to manage the cables, because uh, the cords. If you're treating a lot of people with electrotherapy and you're you're sp you're, you're untangling webs, you know these rats' nests half the time. You don't want to waste your time doing that. So you want to be kind of uh, have a, like a little protocol on how you actually manage the cables. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, even though I do it, I still get them tangled sometimes. It drives me crazy. I used to spend a half hour every day because we would share rooms, uh, other acupuncturists. And and they'd move us all around, and I'd go into a room, and I'd look at the machine sometimes, and it was like, oh, I have to spend five minutes untangling these darn cables, you know. So someday they'll, they'll maybe they'll develop uh, cables that are that are uh, no cables, or uh, or something that retracts, or you can pull it out and then zip it back. I, I, there's got to be a way to do it. I've thought about years about trying to develop something, but hey, it's just you know, it's never happened. Okay. Let's move forward. Hang with me. We're going to get to the electrotherapy. I guarantee it. But uh, this is work on a little bit of foundation stuff too. Um, 
I'd like to talk a little bit, very little about practice management um, because I, I've spent a lot of time in, uh, developing practice. You could be the greatest acupuncturist in the world and you can be sitting twirling your thumbs and I've seen this over and over again. In fact, many of the people I know that are great acupuncturists have terrible practices. They just don't have bus the business skills and they don't teach it very well in, in acupuncture school. I spent a year with David Singer, very hardcore practice management stuff. Uh, some of it fit my personality, some of it didn't, so I just took what I felt was I could, I could feel good about with integrity and, uh, and, uh <coughs> and, and uh, left, left some of it on the, on the table that it just didn't feel right. But he's a brilliant guy, uh, David Singer, m amazing. So <coughs> for people that are just starting practice especially, I would totally recommend doing some type of practice management classes because it's so, it's some of the worst acupuncturists that I think that I see that have, have the greatest practices. They know how to manage manage people and manage cases and set up treatment plans. So one thing I, I think maybe you might want to uh, consider is specializing, having a specialty practice. This is one thing I wish I'd have done when I, when I started. Um, I've since retired from private practice, so it's not going to help me now, but <coughs> um, if I had it, because everybody, uh, there's so many general practitioners that just try and treat everything out there. But if you can specialize in one thing, uh, find what area of Chinese medicine you like treating. Some people like you know, fertility, some people digestive issues, some people, there's actually some of the more successful acupuncturists I know in the nation are, have ophthalmology specialties. They're working on, on eyes. Can you imagine that? How difficult that must be? And they've got thriving practices. Um, but I, if I had to do it all over again, I would have specialized in, in uh, orthopedic acupuncture and I would have branded myself. You, I would name my clinic. This is orthopedic acupuncture, treating painful conditions. And, and then make that your um, focus. That's what you, when you take educational classes, that's what you take. You take classes related to that and you talk to people. You tell them what you do, you all, all that you've learned and you become the specialist in your area of acupuncture. Uh, many times I would refer people to other, to other practitioners that I just didn't have, feel comfortable with. And mostly it involved herbs. I had an herbalist friend, who was amazing, one of my teachers actually, when I thought somebody could benefit from herbs, I, oh, I'd send them to him. And people will do that, acupuncturists will do that. They'll share people. If you don't have an expertise in something, then uh, there's nothing wrong with sending them to somebody else. And, and many times that'll come back. But if you, but think about specializing, because I think it, um, I bought a book on practice management and I didn't know what it was. He says practice management's in a little book and he sends it to me. It's all, the whole point of the book is specialize. Have a specialty practice, that's the key. So something to think about anyway. The key is to find um, something you're passionate about, right? For me, because of my history, uh, treating pain was my, was my passion. Uh, I did, I played around with different things. I played around with um, um, fertility for a while. I had a nice fertility thing going on for quite a while. I got interested in it. I did a lot of courses on it. Um, am I okay? I think I'm coming loose here. Um, thank you. Got it. This is new for me. <laughs> okay. Um, I even tried, I had a friend that was into, she had all sorts of beauty products. She sold facial stuff. And she talked me into doing facial rejuvenation. And I took a, I took a weekend seminar in Los Angeles on face, And I just, I really struggled with it, but got it. She said, we can make so much money at this. And you know, when, as you, when you get kids in college, it, it, money becomes a little more important. So I thought, okay, okay, I'll try it. Yeah. So I did a, a this facial rejuvenation class, co uh, cosmetic stuff, and I gave it a year. I gave it a good year. I said, I'll give it a good chance to see how it, how it works, how it helps. And she was incredibly marketing. She was like, incredible. In the town that I practiced, the Willow Glen, everybody knew who we were. And uh, I, had, I was on Channel 11 News talking about it. <coughs> and... Um, Channel 11 is kind of big news up in Northern California. I don't know about here. But um, honestly, God, I just couldn't get results that I was happy with. You know, and I just, 
I just, I can't do that. If I, if I don't really feel something is, is really benefiting, I know some people would see some mi minor stuff, but I, I, it was a terrible feeling going back and practicing something that you just don't really think is, might not be working. Uh, yeah, you just lose your integrity almost, you know? You just, so I finally, I told her after a year, I said, you know, Amy, I, I can't do it anymore. I said, I appreciate it. You know, we put a lot of work into it. She had her whole beauty line. I said, let's find another acupuncturist for you that specializes in that. It's just not for me. Best thing I ever did, <laughs> honestly. And I got back to treating what I enjoy, you know, mostly pain stuff. So, so try, to find a, try to find something you really tie into, pa have passion for. So I had a friend of mine that, that, that talks about uh, three elements for a successful practice. And I promise not to go on with this very much longer, this uh, the, uh, practice management. But number one is passion. Or you can uh, call it your mission. Or call it your life purpose. But it's got to be something that kind of gets you out of bed in the morning. It makes you feel fulfilled, right? Fulfill you, know, you have to feel fulfilled by what you do. So number one is find an area of acupuncture. And maybe it's the whole thing, you know? And some people it is. My mind, I can't take it all in. I had to specialize and, and just do something and concentrate on one thing that I, that I thought I could get, get good at and that I really enjoyed. And so every class I took became orthopedic stuff or lecture acupuncture stuff. I've taken every class. Uh, so, so mission, passion, your life purpose, whatever you want to call it. Number two, you got to make money. You got to make money on it. You, you deserve to be rewarded for your, and this is where people have the biggest problem is in, in money. Right, they're always worried about if people can pay for their services. So we reduce our service, we reduce our what, we're, what we charge for people. But there's a psychology to that. If the cheaper you are, the, 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 the worst acupuncturist people think you are. You know, people that are charging 150 bucks, they're, they're getting people in in the droves because everybody thinks, God, they must be s doing something special. They're going to charge that much money. And that doesn't mean you need to gouge people either, but charge a fair fee for what you do. And you can feel good about yourself. You're not gouging anybody. Yeah, and then, and then the third thing is, is become great. Become great at what you do. And if you put all your energy into something, all your studies into something, you can do it and you will do it. And you'll become the go-to person in your community. And out of this, you you find your niche you, you get your niche and I, I think there's really some value in that finding something um, that you that differentiates you from other practitioners in your area makes you special but the key is you got to find something that's that's here your passion your life purpose that's the key for me obviously it was it was uh, <coughs> orthopedic acupuncture and the use of electrotherapy. I became, my wife would say I'm obsessed. I haven't read a book that's not related to, ch to medicine in 25 years. That's what I enjoy to do. I go on vacation, I'll take a book on something uh, medically re related. Okay. One other thing I did that was really, really helpful for me, amazingly effective, I had no idea, was I found an online uh, group for m people with uh, in orthopedic acupuncture. Uh, I, I joined a group called Discussions on Acupuncture Orthopedics with a, a, a man named, the moderator is um, Jamie Chavez, C-H-A-V-E-S, Jamie Chavez, J-A-I-M-E. And he's just a brilliant, a brilliant acupuncturist with orthopedics. He knows every orthopedic test, how to really target which exactly which um, muscle or tendons involved in pain. But you get all these other people that you can share ideas from. I learned so, I've learned so much. I've, I've been in, only involved in this thing probably a year. And I just can't believe all the information I've, I've got. I thought I had it down. Don't ever think you know it all, because I'm telling you, we, we don't. And it's easy to get full of yourself sometimes. You think you, what you're doing is, is the perfect way to do it. But, um, but you've got to keep an open mind and, uh, and learn new things from people. I used to treat shoulder problems, uh, shoulder joint problems, I used to like to treat 
a point in the front, maybe John Chan, one of these points, and then a point in the back, posterior. And I like to, I always like to, if I can in a joint, I try to come through the joint from different angles, in the front or the back of, the, of it. I thought, and I got really good results that way once I started doing that. <coughs> and then I, this other guy in the group does this thing that, um, where he not only does two needles, he does, he does two in front, and another one down a little bit lower, and then does small intestine nine, small intestine 10 in the back, and he crosses them, crosses the, the electricity. So he saturates the joint a little bit better, I think. I wouldn't use that when you first start with people because there's always a danger with that electroacupuncture of overstimulating, especially. So when you first do, do acupuncture on people, keep it simple, you know, just and keep it real gentle, right? and warn the person that there could be some soreness after the first one or two treatments. When people get sore, it's usually after the first one or two treatments. And it's usually because the amplitude's too high or the frequency's too high. Uh, in most cases, it's, well, could be either one. Um, so keep it simple. But if I have a patient that I've treated for a while, um, I'll do this treatment and it just adds a little bit more. And you're bringing more opiates to the area, endogenous opiates to the area when you do that. And so I use it in a lot of different spots. I won't just hook up uh, a pair of leads, I'll hook up a second pair, and it'll bring more pain relievers, opiates to the site, the pain. But I don't do that till after the first couple of treatments, make sure they can handle it, they don't get, they're not getting really sore. You'll just have something, I'm telling you, some people just cannot do electroacupuncture. It's just, they're scared, they don't like the pulsation feeling, um, and you just can't do it, so you do manual. You know, very small percentage, probably one or two percent that I've had that just did not like it. Or they had a prior experience that wasn't positive with electroacupuncture. Um, but if it's done correctly, it's, it should be very gentle. If you're getting fasciculation with a needle, if you ever see a needle jumping, take it out and move it. You're too close to the nerve, right? And just and because you want to keep it just a real gentle, gentle tapping sensation. Okay. Another group that's really good, besides Jamie, uh, Jamie's group, um, is a group called, um, it's a new group that started in their back east, it's called Electroacupuncture Medicine. And they're, they're working kind of outside the line, right? they're, they're developing some really neat protocols right now, and they're using different frequencies, a different, combining different frequencies in the body. Uh, it's really amazing work. Uh, it's worth looking into. I'm actually going to take one of their courses here soon. Uh, I got to go back. Actually, my th the class I'm going to do is in Seattle. They're not doing any Western trips, but they, um, <coughs> the East Coast is a little bit ahead of us on this type of stuff, and and Canada too, especially Canada. They're doing a lot of stuff with orthopedic stuff. There's a man that teaches a a, a class in um, a pro program, acupuncture program. It's a medical acupuncture program in Canada. It's at McMaster's University. His name's Alejandro. Not neuropuncture. And we'll talk about uh, uh, Michael, though. Uh, Michael Cordino does a, something called neuropuncture. Uh, this guy in the McMaster's teaches something called neurofunctional acupuncture. The guy's brilliant. If you, if you look up McMaster's University and uh, an acupuncture program, and you, you, can, you can look at some of his interviews and some, uh, some of his speeches. He's just a brilliant guy. Great program. So they got some really kind of neat stuff going on back east. Uh, uh, on, on the use of electroacupuncture and the, some really some great advancements, I think. Um, yeah. Okay. And the last thing, uh, uh, patients need um, guidance. They need a roadmap. So if, you, if you're treating a patient and you're just coming back every day and every time you treat them, you gotta, you're scheduling a new visit, mm, not, not probably a great idea. You wanna set people up with a treatment plan Okay, but, but do it honestly with integrity. And so what I used to do <coughs> when I first saw a patient, I say, let's do four visits. And, and we can kind of judge your rate of response. If you don't feel any change in four visits for most things, it's not gonna help. And that's honest, the truth. I mean, unless it's something a little more severe, like a, a herniated disc, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. You can get, you can get incredible results with herniated discs, though, believe it or not. Um, but in most cases, uh, I say four visits. So you set those four visits up right away. They come in, you talk to them, uh, you do some education, and then you set up those four treatment plans, okay, to see how they're doing. And you let them know, we wanna see positive change, even if it's for a day or, or for a couple hours. 
if we see positive change within, th within those first four visits, there's hope. There's a good chance we can help what they've got going on. If not, mm, it's going to be tough. But sometimes there are other factors. People have diabetes. They don't respond as quickly. Um, so there are, are some mitigating factors. But for the most part, I would say I would use four as a kind of a guidelines to, just to get you started. And then after the four treatments, if you see positive, you can say, okay, hey, um, uh, I believe it's going to take 12 visits to really fix your condition. I'll talk about a good way to set that up, too. We're going to change tapes? Yeah. Okay, we're just going to pause for just a minute. I promise we'll get to the electoral stuff. We're close. <laughs> 